Welcome to Hiraith, the home of modern Welsh politics. The campaigns are all but over, but how much has really happened to move the needle of Welsh politics? What will the results be this week and who will be in charge once it's all said and done? All these big questions need important guests. So joining me, Kerry and Rich, this evening, we have Cathy Owens, former Welsh Government Special Advisor and Director, Director of Derin Public Affairs. Hello, Cathy. Hello. Uh, and we have also with us Neris Evans, who was the Assembly Member for Mid and West Wales between 2007 and 2011, and also Director of Derin Public Affairs. Hello, Neris. Hello. Uh, thank you both so much for coming to talk to us today. Um, the first question I wanted to ask is, does it feel like there's been an election on? There's less, less of a build-up, isn't there, because of the official campaign period. People haven't been out knocking doors. It hasn't been an eight, you know, the 18-month run-up where you know new candidates can build their profile and things. So it's been quite intense in terms of the party activity. And I'm sure people will see the literature through their doors that you know that's only allowed to happen in the last month. So it is obviously different. It's more online. I think I've been out knocking doors in a couple of constituencies. People and like really happy to see politicians knock their doors. So that's probably the first time that's happened in a while. They actually can have conversations with people. So it is a, is a different um, election in that sense. And obviously, you know, we're in a pandemic, so that's the priority. That's what people are talking about. Um, and the election kind of is massively overshadowed by that. So it is it's a different one. Obviously, us as political nerds are living and breathing it. So we know it's on, but how much of a cut through? I think we've seen, you know, people, I'm more aware um, of the Senate than its powers now. So I think those conversations on the doorsteps are easier to have because you don't have to explain to people about the Senate, what it does, the powers. Um, specifically, I've been out in Command the West South Pembrokeshire today. You know, when I stood there a couple of elections ago, that first conversation is explaining what the assembly is to start off with. So you're not there in terms of the recognition. Um, so it's a you know, different context that we're in, really. Yeah, I think it's difficult to judge, isn't it? Because we're we're right in the middle of it, and it, you know it does dominate what we do day in day out, and also the media that we consume, which is probably very different from what let's just say normal people would consume on a regular basis, you know. And I think it's going to be interesting because on Thursday, I think we'll find out that um, you know Twitter doesn't necessarily reflect the voters. We've had a really roller, a bit of a roller coaster in terms of the polling over the last eighteen months. Really vast differences in polling. But it does seem to have tightened up in the last couple of months. Um, is there an opportunity for the public to surprise us? I think there probably is. I think Neris and I would probably agree there's quite a few shy Tories out there that aren't necessarily reflected in our Twitter worlds um, or necessarily on polling either. So quite a lot, I'd say, yeah. um, in some really key constituencies. And you know, might go on to talk about campaigning techniques. You know, we've known it um, in a number of constituencies, the campaigning techni techniques, the, the systems run by London, the, you know, they've got the data on their supporters from the general election. It's just about getting those out on um, election day or getting them signed up to be postal voters, getting them to make sure they return their postal vote and get them out to vote. So they don't need to be out knocking doors as other parties in some constituencies um, and I think we'll see a lot of that reflected. Challenges though if you've banged on about the Senate not being important and then actually trying to get people out to, to vote for it so that's a challenge for them on Thursday but yeah agree with Cathy there which was the first point of agreement possibly. Can you just make a note of that because it's not going downhill here on you mentioned social media, but how do you feel the the mainstream media coverage has gone during this election? Has it been good enough? You know, the Beeb were heavily criticised for the leaders' debate, I think. You know, what's your take on um, the mainstream media approach to this election? I think it really has gone... It has changed so much in the last 15, 20 years. Um, you know, I, I, it, and it has been really odd when you're in the middle of a campaign you rec you realize that the, the media campaign bears absolutely no relation to what you're doing every day you know and i think that's the mainstream media channels you know they how do they cover this well they they sit down at the start of the campaign saying this is how we're going to do it this is what we're going to cover on this day so it's actually quite hard for the party to say well actually we'd like you to cover this over here and they're saying, oh, well, I'm sorry, it's transport day today. We're doing transport. It's like, well, yeah, I'm, but we're talking about social care. Oh, no, we've decided to do transport today. So could you do it as a transport story? So it is, it is really, you have, to, you have to navigate that um, in terms of you have to have a better understanding of, of what and when 
to engage and how to engage with the mainstream media in a way that doesn't necessarily do exactly what they want. It's not going to necessarily reflect exactly what you want either. You've got to find a way to cut through in the middle. I have to say, those debates are not much fun for, for, for me to watch. And if I don't enjoy them, I can't imagine Mrs Jones is enjoying them very much indeed. So I just think there's got to be a better way of doing that, hasn't there? I mean, it just, it's a bit like a Rorschach test anyway, isn't it? You're going to you're going to, you already know who, who you think, you know, what you think about different people, unless they make an absolute massive clangor, you're going to come out with just agreeing with who you thought was quite good before they went in. So I don't think they sway very much unless people, let's just say, make tits of themselves. And that doesn't happen very often. It gives you a little bit of a, um, an understanding of what they're really like, I guess. But is that really true? I think perhaps the mainstream media is quite good for building up a picture of somebody over time. And I think, um, you know, that maybe has made a bit of a difference. So little of your campaign these days is focused on what would what you would have been doing 25 years ago. And it really has changed quite significantly in my time. Yeah, I'd agree that it, it's changed, got slightly better, but we're starting on such a low base. It's still shocking not just in terms of the topics they pick, but just the lack of analysis and lack of actual Absolutely. scrutiny. It's, it's shocking, you know, that's what we do. We look at yeah. what they're saying, we look at trends, we look at, actually, they, they said something different last week, yeah. or the manifesto doesn't actually reflect what they've been banging on about for the last couple of years. But just the face value, um, you know, of all broadcasters, I guess, and I guess if people are listening to this podcast, they're actually interested in, in the politics and, and then the analysis of it. It's just the complete lack of that. It's just, the you know, the leaders were in different constituencies today, right? Yeah. Okay, what does that mean? <laughs> Why are they there? Why are they not in other constituencies? You know, just, yeah. And I, and I get, you know, they, they've also had to deal with things last minute, not knowing if an election was going ahead, not knowing you know, the parameters around how the election would be held, but it's just a bit low level. Good example today, I think it was Wales today, there was a really nice piece about business support post-COVID or post-May actually in terms of business support. So really interesting look at a couple of businesses in terms of how they think the support has gone and what they'd like uh, in the future. And then at the end it said, and if you'd like to find out what the parties are offering, you can go on the website and read the, read the manifestos. It's like, so you're not even actually giving that, uh, giving that level. Of, we, we aren't even going to tell you what they're offering, let alone give you any sort of analysis in between. And it was followed up by a piece about the A470 with people wanting shorter routes on the A470. It's like, since when has that been a story? That hasn't been a story for, for 10 to 15. It, and like no relation to what's going on around them. Well, is that the most important priority at this moment in time? So, so the zero an analysis thing actually has given a lot more room to people like you, people like us, you know, people who talk about it all the time. People want to hear what's going on through different media, through podcasts. People are reading my terrible Twitter reviews of manifestos because like nobody else is doing it. I think literally there's only about 16 people in Wales that have read that Clyde Cammy manifesto from cover to cover. And I'm one of, I'm, unfortunately, I'm one of them. But who else is doing it? Who is, who is providing that analysis? You know, you've mentioned those leaders debates. How do you think the leaders have performed overall? You might have to ask the narrow this one because I, <laughs> I haven't actually watched them all. Honestly, they're that awful. I've like, you know, I've, I've watched elements, I've watched bits of them. And I just thought, you know, I just, it's just too much. Are we, are we the target audience there? Because well, I I watched it. Watched it. Who the bloody hell else is? You know? well, that's, yeah, but <laughs> we've made up our minds we're voting for, surely. We are interested and, I, you know, it's just a weird format. Mm. Is standing behind a podium trying to, you know, get your point across and trying to score political points against other leaders? Is that really what we want? And is that the qualities that we value in politicians? Does that what does that say to us about the sound bites? Again, I think it goes back to the scrutiny and the attention to detail of what people and parties are standing for that is just lacking. I've spoken to many people on the doorstep and decided that had seen the leaders' debate and were impressed um, with the content and impressed with what Adam was saying specifically. Obviously, surprise, surprise, canvassing for pride. Um, so yeah, I think it's just a weird format, isn't it? I think the Q and A's have been a bit better. I've been quite, I quite enjoyed this, the proper sit down, half mm. an hour, or whatever it was. Let's give you a, a bit of a grilling. Uh, I think they've been a bit more valuable, actually. 
the interviews, the long form interviews that all of the uh, certainly the first minister contenders have given have been really interesting. And mm. um, the, the whole concept of the debates, essentially, they're just the production of social media clips. Now, they have no, no one actually watches the debates. The parties obviously just clip up the bits they like and share them and I really hope that this year is the last year that we see that kind of fiasco because it was both incredibly un unpleasant to watch and it does encourage exactly as you said now Riz, the kind of behavior in leaders that we don't like as the electorate so why we do why are we all going through this ritual this painful yeah. ritual every five years or so we just don't need it we should be doing something better and hopefully by the time the senate election comes around next time the media, domestic media market in Wales will have matured a little bit. We can do something a bit more advanced and intelligent and insightful. Saying that, I'm going to completely be hypocritical now and say about the UK <laughs> leaders debate when Leanne was on them. I was part of the team, you know, oh, behind the scenes doing the interviews, and that was different. <laughs> you know, that was the first time we did it. The buzz, and obviously applied having that platform on a UK wide basis was something else. It, it was brilliant in terms of exposure, in terms of getting points across, in terms of people understanding who applied were and Leanne and you know she did really well. And just that being part of that discussion on a UK wide basis. But still, this point still stands in terms of what does it actually prove. But um and at that time it's you know I think it served a purpose uh, and was good for applied at that time and the SNP. If the leaders are in that kind of position, how do you both feel the parties are fair generally in, in terms of getting their key messages across? If you, th if you think about it, they're all trying to stick to some of their core messaging, which I think has sort of worked, whether it's the right core messaging or not. You know, we'll find out, I guess. So, you know, the Tories talking about the M4, for example, has obviously cut through a bit. You know, whether it'll have an impact, we, we, we don't know, you know. Clearly, Adam is, you know, making independence his sort of number one priority campaign issue. And, you know, Mark is doing the sort of safe pair of hands thing. So that is, you know, you must, they are coming across in the way that they, they want to, I guess. Um, and then it's just a case of, are we listening? Are we taking that on board? Is that something that is the right priority in, in these times? And I think that's where the election will, um, will, sh will show that. I mean, <laughs> Is the M4 going to make a difference in Newport West? Maybe the vote for the Labour Party in Newport West is a little bit softer, but I, I can't imagine that, that delivering the M4 at a time of COVID is what is going to you know, carry the Conservatives over the line. We're not seeing necessarily, in terms of priorities, is, are voters, do, what, do voters want to see independence as the key priority? Um, I don't think so, unless you're already voting for Plaid, maybe. You know. well, Half of Labour voters uh, in the Kiwis, Cathy. Yeah, and they'll be voting for Labour. But that's the th but they not only will they be voting for Labour, but all the Labour supporters will also be voting for Labour. You know, I don't think there's been enough of a switch there because um, if that's your one, if that's the one thing you are going to be talking about. People haven't quite got there yet. Maybe they might quite like the concept of it, but not the practicalities yet. So they're still voting for Labour. You know, I, but, uh, unless the polls are telling us that actually there's been a significant shift and that, and, you know, Plaid are going to make the big breakthrough this year. I, I think we're going to have to say that maybe that was a strategic decision that could have, that could have been better. I'm trying to find a polite way of putting this, Neris. Sorry. <laughs> I can see that you're trying. <laughs> yeah, well, I think underneath those messages, though, as in, Kerry, your question about, you know, the party messaging, you know, there are top line things that we, we see and consume but I would imagine that every party has got a quite sophisticated way of targeting their messaging according to the demographic they're trying to attract. So be that on social media, be that with targeted mail, be that with specific messages on the doorstep, you know, according to the constituency or the region. So the difficulty there is not much difference between the key policies when, you know, in some of those areas within the party. So it's, you know, a thousand extra nurses, two thousand extra nurses, social care, you know. So how do you get your how do you get your message across when it actually what is the point of differentiation in in some of those, you know, more detailed messaging that they're trying to get across to, to key audiences, really? And it's a difficult one. And as we've looked at the manifesto, there is a lot of common ground in some of those key policy areas as well. 
So I, I know Rich wants to come in, but I unmuted first. So, so do the parties generally tailor messages to regions? Because we did a little recording earlier on, which will come out tomorrow. And some of my friends in North Wales are saying that Betsy's still a big, big regional topic up there. But we found that down here in South Wales, you know, it just doesn't register as a message. But it's, I'm told that the Conservatives do use it in North Wales. So is yeah. that something the parties do? Do they tailor the messages to the regions? We've definitely seen that. And I think that Facebook advertising in particular has gone in that direction and also the direct mail. So, um, you know, a lot of people will be getting gold plated letters from Boris Johnson, you know, handwritten um, in, in North East Wales. Uh, you know, this is where the parties differ a little bit. The Conservatives are really quite good at this and they've got a lot of money to do it. It is quite a costly thing to do. They'll be getting a lot of targeted um, um, letters with Boris Johnson's face on it. Um, and it will be very targeted for each particular uh, patch or each particular cohort. They've got very good data, you know, that's quite granular, um, but all parties will um, amend their, their online advertising as well. So um, the M4 message in, is really being pushed in, in Newport, for example, and, and less elsewhere. So we are seeing quite a, quite a targeted variation uh, where, where we're talking about on, online advertising and potentially local, local leafleting as well. There's a quite a few parties uh, offering independence now um, in this election, but the major ones you'd say are Plaid and the, the Green Party. <laughs> Look at Cassie's face. <laughs> Shock and horror. Well, um, when you say offering independence, well, you mean, offer, like, well, you, asking people to vote for it, but they can't maybe deliver it. Yeah, I, I, I understand. And they can't win any seats either. Apart no. from that, yeah. Apart from that, they're yeah. offering it, but do you feel like they've almost sort of held back on it a bit? Adam seems to have stopped talking about it quite as much as I thought he was going to. Do you think that's a, a response to the fact that people don't really want to talk about independence as much as our sort of weird Twitter bubbles are all ablaze with it all the time? Firstly, on the Greens, I am a bit disappointed, but they have disappeared over the last five years. They had quite a high profile five years ago. They're not going to increase their rate. They're going to get about three and a half percent. So it doesn't it really doesn't matter what he says because nobody's ever heard of him. And then I think with Adam, I think he has actually been talking about ind independence a fair bit as, as that point of difference. But I just don't think the rate, you know, I'm not sure who he's trying to target there. In terms, you know, I think this election mainly is between Mark Drakeford and Boris Johnson, weirdly. But, you know, for the Labour Party, it is, a, it is an election in which they're standing against the Conservatives and the main. There are only, say, two seats in which um, they are standing against Plaid Cymru. If pushing independence as your number one concern is, is your point of difference, I just... You know, strategically, I don't think it's breaking through in labour areas. So where do Plaid Cymru go from here is what I would question in terms of big strategic issues. Are they going to try and capture a couple of the, the conservative rural marginals in the future? Or, you know, do they shift in a particular way that is, is a tr more attractive to labour heartlands? It's, I'm not quite sure, but I think they are going to have to have these decisions after the election because, I mean, there's no doubt Clyde are going to get more seats than they've got now, partly because of the number of UKIP seats that are coming back on the list, both to the Conservatives and Plaid Cymru through, through the maths, in a sense, but... Um, through the maths? Well, through people voting Clyde? Well, yes, but, you know, post, post the... Let's talk about the UKIP 7, really, you know, they are naturally coming back anyway. Um, so I don't think Clyde are going to increase their votes substantially. They aren't, you know, they, they might they might build one or two points, but it, the polling isn't saying that they're significantly growing their votes, and it doesn't look like they're significantly growing their vote in in Labour seats. So, so that, I think that's a big decision for Clyde after, after the election in terms of which direction they go. Uh, taking all those points on board, but I just think it's amazing that this is even part of the political discourse um, at this election. When I was in the Assembly, granted that was over 10 years back, I remember I did an interview in the Western Mail and the headline was, Wales will be independent within my lifetime. And the amount of abuse I got, like, you know, the fact that I even mentioned independence or it was a surprise that we stood for independence and as director of policy, it was in every manifesto and we had to make a decision. Do we lead with this? Is it in the, in the top two pages or do we hide it in the back when we're talking about, you know, where's in the world and all the rest of it? So the fact that it's even been discussed, the fact that the, you know, 
in the curious uh, Labour supporters, the fact that three Labour candidates support it, for me, that massively shifted the dial. And, you know, part of it is because of external things happening in terms of the last the UK, part of it is that momentum in terms of Yes Cymru. Um, I think Adam's been right to, to, um, to lead on that and to use that as a key policy aim. You know, you know, for us, this is what we've been thinking and wanting for as Plaid members for so long. And I think now we've got the confidence to talk about this. But, so for me, even having this as part of the discussion is a, you know, is a massive positive thing. Just to put a negative spin on that, and I do apologise, Neris. What you're basically saying is independence is no longer a drag on the Plaid Cymru tickets. And I think that's a different way of looking at it. And those, those three Labour candidates are definitely voting for Labour, is my point. Yeah, and my point is, it's it's something mainstream. The fact that we've got this political podcast and we're talking about independence. For me, the fact that we actually talk about it is is a good thing. Which is my point back to Matthew. You know, that's not the first question to be asking. I don't think it's just not the priority of the voters. TUC put something out today that was really interesting. You know, what people want to hear about is about investment in public services and you know, uh, and jobs. So I, I really do think that you know we can talk about this until the cows come home. But, uh, it, you know, and there's a lot of it in our Twitter world. But, um, you know, Twitter is not the electorate. But, but just to follow up on that, Cathy, I think one of the interesting things about that TUC polling very clearly showed that the direction of travel for the whole population of Wales was to more autonomy for Wales. I think that's exactly mm. where the Labour Party is sitting at the moment. And I think, so I think, I think the Labour Party have done enough and Marcus Drakeford has sort of done enough to be able to demonstrate that you know they're pro devolution, that they stand up to London and and blunt any projected growth of a, of a Plaid Cymru vote because quite a few people have joined Yes Cymru on Twitter. You know, it's just um, it, it's it's two two different things, I'd say. But, but but the interesting thing, and this is where I, I imagine I'll get a, a wry smile from Neris from saying this, is that more devolution for Wales is also something that the party can't deliver. Um, it has as much chance of being getting more devolution as independence while Boris Johnson is still prime minister. So I, I, what I was going to follow up on is the fact that the, the idea of independence as an idea, I think it's a term that has a very weird um, uh, kind of interpretation of what that word actually means, because when Ply Cymru launched their independence manner um, commission earlier in the year, the conclusion was confederalism. And you look at the ambitions uh, as laid out by a huge swathe of the um, uh, uh, the campaigns within the Labour Party and the answer is for the future is confederalism. Put that on a t-shirt. I mean well, it's just like, so unsexy to be to be sitting you know. Hang on, just... I've got my confederalism <laughs> t-shirt on. <laughs> we've got to find we've got to find such a better way of describing this because it's just you know, it's really quite sexy to be at either end of this spectrum, isn't it? But it's just really boring to be in the middle. Yes. But somehow that is actually where most people in Wales are sitting. I, I think we've got to find a better way of describing it. Well, that, actually, I think it, the it, argument here is particularly from from the people who, you know, understandably are um, have a long standing um, uh, disagreement with the ideals and electoral threat posed by Ply Cymru is that independence has previously been a stick to beat Ply Cymru. And actually what it has now become for an element within the Labour Party is an electrifying element, although it it may not actually cause voters to switch from one party allegiance think, to another. The salience has lifted as a discussion. Point I think electrifying the is thing. pushing it a little bit, Richard. It's you just called it sexy. No, no, it's not. It's not sexy. It's not an electrifying issue. The, my my point being, you know, we are still talking about the Constitution. Mrs Jones is definitely not talking about the Constitution. We can talk about it until the cows, cows come home. Yes, it, you know, we are having more sensible conversations about it. And I'm over the moon that, in, you know, that we, that people better understand uh, devolution. And I, I absolutely want to see more of it. We've got to find a way of making the UK work better and, you know, but there are some benefits in having mutually agreed unions with frictionless borders. Uh, mm. Unfortunately, we're not going to have that because the internal market bill. But anyway, that's a, that's another thing. Well, that, that, isn't that that, that gets to the very heart of it? Is that, Who's is voting it? about that? You know, no one is voting on these issues. It is, you know, it's nurses, it's social care, it's jobs. And, you know, it isn't where the election is. Um, I think I heard somebody saying that this election is all about COVID and the Constitution. I really don't think it is. I think it's about the recovery. It's about COVID, no doubt. It's about who, you know, it's about who is who can be trusted to to get the NHS 
back on track in a way and to deliver those jobs. You know, you, I suppose after the election, if if Pike Cymru have been able to galvanise all those people who are indie curious to vote for them, you know, we're going to have a huge shift in the in in the pattern of voting. None of the polling has suggested that is going to happen. So, you know, I, I think there's still some work to be done there. But there is a party, obviously, talking about abolition of uh, the Senate. But they're one of a number of small parties. Like, how do both of you feel that the small parties might fear in this uh, election? I spent most of a rainy bank holiday going through the maths on the regional seats. And uh, at least four people have read that article, no doubt. But it's quite interesting because it is quite difficult for abolish the Assembly not to win a couple of seats, given the maths that we've got. You know, if they can consolidate that vote in a way that voters understand it, because that's the problem. They are competing against other abolitionist groups, aren't they, really? The electoral system means that you only need to get about 6%, 6.5% in a region uh, to, to, to win a regional vote, um, win a regional seat. And they're polling at 7%. So um, it'd be quite hard for them not to get a seat in at least three different regions. That, I think three is where we'll probably end up with. It, it could be that voters, you know, um, w- when they actually put their put their cross on the ballots, maybe they haven't been sophisticated enough in their campaigning and then people still think that UKIP and reform and whoever the hell else is on the ballot paper also reflect their views. So they aren't consolidated into one set of voters. But theoretically, there absolutely there's enough votes on that sort of contrarian right for at least three abolished seats, I would say. And if you think about it, what difference will it make, right? If you look about, if you look at the the amazing legacy left behind by those seven UKIP, vote, UKIP Senate members. I mean, it's pretty much zero, isn't it? I mean, you could look back at what they've delivered over time, over the last five years. And I think, uh, you know, actually UKIP, um, you know, we talked to UKIP before the last election about potentially what was going to be in their manifesto. And afterwards, we just thought, you know, we never we never need to speak to these people again. And they they provided a little bit of, um, a little bit of sort of contrarian, right-wing challenge at FMQs once a week. It was a bit of comedy. We all tweeted about the, the, the mild racism, sexism, homophobia, and that was about it. They made no difference to what was going on other than by um, actually changing, changing the numbers so much that, you know, Plaid and Conservatives couldn't do a pre, the pre-election agreement that they wanted, and Cameron was first minister by the end of the week. So, you know, the numbers actually helped. So, it, what, what other difference did they make? So the fact that we're going to get Mark Reckless back, what difference will it make over the next few years? It's, it, will they be able to successfully use that platform to galvanise further abolitionist votes? Well, the, I think the opposite is true, isn't it? So, you know, what difference would it make? And the big problem that we face if we do get more of similar candidates elected who do run essentially the EU Parliament playbook of UKIP, which is to sit there, complain, make a lot of noise and contribute nothing, is that we actually lose the ability to legislate, particularly if we need a supermajority for that kind of reform in the Senate in the next term. It kind of should be uh, a wake-up call for all parties, uh, certainly those of the centre and the left, to prioritise Senate reform. Do you think we'll see that in the next term? You know, will they, you know, will will three of them, having three abolished Senate members, uh, stop any agreed deal between you know, if there has to be, if there is one about the size of the assembly, absolutely not. Really, it's not going to make that much difference. Yeah, and the key to that is the Labour Party, and I'm sure most um, Labour MSs uh, would support constitutional reform, increasing the size of the Senate, changing the voting system. It's whether the Labour Party prioritises enough, whether they think it's electorally popular, whether it's a priority for a programme of government, and obviously. I would suggest that it would be very high up on the list of of Plaid priorities and Plaid would very usefully give the Labour Party cover in order to do that, I would suggest. (laughs) Uh, But it wouldn't be a difficult sell. I think the Labour Party would be really happy to sign up, not really happy, would be content to sign up to it. Is that a point of agreement, Cathy? I think that what the biggest failure of those in, my very good friends in Plaid who... um, uh, you know, are very keen to for an expanded uh, Senate than many friends in Labour as well. Is still is still the political cost of that to Labour, 
Um, and, and if that has to be solved by um, a, a, a power broking deal, then, then that's probably the best way of getting to it. Because I don't think there was enough recognition when all that work was happening, you know, with Laura McAllister and Ellen and others really trying their very best. You know, it was like you're pointing your, your guns in the wrong direction here. You've got to reduce the political cost of labour uh, to make this happen. Therefore, you've got to persuade the Conservatives. It's not, you know, we're standing against the Conservatives at a UK level. Uh, you know, if if at the same time, you know, you're going to say that we're increasing the number of, of the cost of politics, all this sort of thing. So so that's the issue. And if reducing the cost of that is saying, well, we had to do it as part of a power breaking agreement, then I think that makes sense. It's probably it's probably the only way of getting it done, to be honest. I, I just want to just look at the the remaining small parties, which we, we might have. I think, uh, Cathy, you you commented on the Greens, which is a, as a Green myself, it, was quite devastating remarks but uh we've also got the lib dems i think when you were both in the in the assembly the senate you know they were a much stronger party than what they are now w where do you see the future um with them we, we, i'm also a brecon and radner boy so following that with much interest do you where, do you see them in the next uh senate yes yeah. i mean the maths makes it again makes it impossible for them not to in a sense given where they're polling if you see what i mean um, you know, that is the electoral system that we have. It does ensure that smaller parties that, that get about, you know, that get about 6% in a region will get a seat. That's that's the proportional nature of it. And that that has, um, you know, that's done the Lib Dems pretty well over the last 21 years, if you think about it. In terms of winning constituency seats, I can't see where they come back at the moment. You know, where would be the point of difference that they have right now? It might be, if you, do, if you think about it, that, that Brexit has actually quite significantly shifted our long-term electoral politics. You know, the, the whole left, right, Lib Dems potentially in the middle sort of doesn't, it doesn't really make that much sense anymore. Um, so, um, you know, it's a really hard road for Labour as well. You know, I think Labour at a UK level, I think on Thursday they're gonna, you know, it's not gonna be pretty. Brexit might have shifted that quite significantly. So, you know, why would you vote Lib Dem? Where is the significant point of difference? Uh, it is a bit of a challenge for them. Plus, they also went into government with the Tories. So, hashtag on a T-shirt in Wales every time there's an election. Um, so, it is. It's quite difficult for them. It's it, it, you know, where they haven't got a very convincing UK leader or a convincing UK platform. Their platform in Wales is no significant. It's no difference at all. Uh, to, the, to the other mainstream parties that are standing here in Wales. So unless you have a particular interest at a local level and you think Bill Powell is the guy that's going to deliver something different for you, you know, why, why would you vote Lib Dem? Unless you really don't like the Conservatives and maybe that's, you know, maybe that's a way back for them, you know, but then again, how many £9,000 sofas does Boris have to get donors to buy for him before you actually stop voting Conservatives? In, in Bracken and Radnorshire. And the Tory supporters don't mind that though, do they? In... Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so, yeah it's, it's Jane Dodds on the list, isn't it? And, you know, paying tribute to Christy Williams, I think she's been a brilliant minister over the last Assembly the Senate term. Um, really, in terms of her policy platform, in terms of her engagement and comms and, you know, being a good minister, but that like, not translating to any change in the electoral fortunes of the Lib Dems because she's busy being the education minister and the, you know, the, the, the capacity of the Lib Dems party and that, that function to keep the party going and support constituencies just isn't there. You know, it was weak years ago and it's even weaker now because that um, attention to party mechanics just isn't there. Um, so, it, yeah, it would be Jane Dodds on the list. And if you look at, what was it, the last but one poll with Labour on 29, which I don't think will happen, but obviously then Mark phones up Jane. Um, we'll have a similar deal, but that's very, very unlikely. Um, and it depends what they do with that. If they will get one MS elected and Jane being that on Thursday, what you know, what do they need to do to change that dial in terms of not just their positioning and their policy platform, but also their you know internal mechanics and capacity to deliver change in some of the key seats they need to win over. So I think we've all got sort of used to uh, those slightly disingenuous Lib Dem bar charts but I was really interested to read your analysis actually Kathy on on how honest some of the parties are being with regards to the list this election mm -hmm. round this time around on the this election 
are those parties being disingenuous? Are some parties being slightly disingenuous with regards to if they are the best option to keep, for, for example, keep the Tories out, which I yeah. keep seeing a lot of in South West Central? Absolutely. If they're saying, if they're saying we have proof to demonstrate that by voting for us on the list, by lending us your support on the list, you will definitely keep out A, the awful people on the right, or B, the awful people on the left. It is not true. It, because the maths are different in every region, for a start. Secondly, how, how much can you shift the dial? In, the percentages are so small, it's, you know, is it, it is really difficult to predict, um, you know, changing one constituency seat within a region has a much bigger effect, uh, potentially. So I think in every region, you've got to look at the maths, which is what I spent all day yesterday doing. Uh, and, you know, at least, as I said, six people will have read Matthew. Thank you very much for having read that article. Even even Neris has read, has read skim read it, I think she said today. It's a really fascinating system. It's, it's so difficult to predict. It is virtually impossible to predict who, who's going to get the full seat um, in, in, every, uh, in, every, in every patch. It's, so... To, to suggest it's the same in five regions is complete and utter tosh. And you have to be able to explain that there's a bit of complexity here. There is no doubt in certain regions, if you really wanted to keep the Conservatives from getting the full seat, there is a potential to vote Ply Cymru. In a couple of regions, actually, it would be better potentially to vote Lib Dem. And in a couple of regions, you really need to be voting Labour on the list to keep the Tories from winning the seats. And, you know, let's face it, there are people on the other side of the argument who are trying to do exactly the same in terms of the Conservatives and, and abolish as well. And, and again, it really is quite, quite tricky to manage that. So if, if somebody is telling you, uh, you should vote for this party in every region on, on, on the list, they aren't being straightforward with you. You know, if you look at the wording, it is, you know, lend us your second vote or whatever. It's not saying this will definitely keep this person out, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. Except that's exactly what Pride Cummings is saying today on Twitter, of course. That's what I'm, Just have a look at Liz's tweet. Okay. I, you know, that's exactly uh, what Pride have been saying. So I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to say is, it, you know, you're, it, you're hoodwinking the, the electorate a little bit if you're saying, you know, this is absolutely proof that you must do this in every region. It's just not true. The complexity is, it's fascinating, but it's fascinating to maths nerds and political nerds. And it's just not true to say that you can absolutely um, game the system in that way. But the margins are so tight in them. I mean, when I, I got elected in Mid and West, um, played one for Nashley and still managed to get the fourth, as in Kennedy Gourmet and Doivar, Clan and East, and Tlenetli, four constituencies out of eight, and we still managed to get the fourth seat on the list. But it was literally out of 60 odd thousand votes, there was literally a couple of hundred in it, where the, it was the applied seat, I think Labour, or I think the Lib Dems would have taken a second or the first seat, I can't remember. So, you know, literally a couple of hundred in it out of 60 odd thousand. So, it, it, you know, it's, it's so hard to predict. I'm so old. I just tell you a story. I actually had to make sure that the Labour Party HQ had Joyce Watson's mobile number after she got elected. It was, it was, it was a comedy event, but I'm, what, I'm, what I mean is we should, be, we should be more used to this by now. We should have a better understanding by now about how this stuff works. It's, it's, it's gonna be very complex, but there are ways of, of, of looking at it. Um, it's just, it's, it is quite, quite an interesting system. Can I just highlight though, um, another thing that will definitely, definitely be happening is people will tell you, in order to prevent, uh, you know, we don't like, basically they'll be writing, a lot of people will be writing pieces to say, we've got to change the electoral system. Look at this result. It's kept Labour in power for 21 years without saying, uh, yeah, but also quite a few people vote Labour. So, you know, um, I think we'll see a lot of those pieces in, in the next few, few weeks. And, you know, my point is you don't have to change the electoral system. You just have to persuade people to vote for you instead. Actually, I don't think this election system, electoral system is reflecting of how people vote. What was the percentage of people no. voting Labour last time and what was the percentage I, they got? That's a, fair, that's a fair point. But in the in-depth and analytical piece you will be writing, I have no doubt you will be reflecting the fact that Labour also tend to win a, a lot more votes than some other parties, partly because people quite like their leaders and policies over time. You know, th that, that has also been true. So um, I just think that we'll see a lot, you know, look out for those interesting articles about why this result means we must change the electoral system. 
Well, I was going to try and squeeze in a question there about um, uh, about whether parties are choosing the correct target seats. But what you've just demonstrated in the last few minutes has prompted me to another question. So can you um, share your thoughts about what it is that makes organisations that are combined of leadership from Labour Party and Plaid Cymru working together that makes them such good organisations? <laughs> oh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I think Nervous is going to make me veto this answer. She's going to... <laughs> Can I just say, we did have a Lib Dem. <laughs> well, we did have a Lib Dem when we set up Dead End, didn't we, 10 years ago? Well, so did the Senate. But, well, that might... <laughs> and we, you know, have, have had a Tory um, consultant over the years as well. You know, we just, we're happy to work with anyone who's politically interested and politically active. <laughs> does, does it show, though, that potential for like Cymru and Labour to work together again in government, like they have done in the past. There's a huge potential of that, and we all know it. And actually, if you ask people in the street, you know, would you be happy if after this election, we had a government that had, you know, elements of Labour and elements of Plaid Cymru, at one way or another, formal or informal, you know, there would be a significant majority for that. And we all know that. People quite like parties working together for any reason in that you know they they quite like uh, multiple parties being in government and that's what we've had for for 21 years we haven't we haven't had a labor majority government for the last 21 years you know we've had different shades and different levels of balance that all happens to have included the labor party and elements of other parties but people quite like the idea of labor party um representing the investment in public services that of course Plaid Cymru would agree with anyway and having that sort of element of additional, you know, let's stand up to London type arguments and working together, nobody has a monopoly on good ideas, all of those things. So people quite just quite like uh, parties working together. So even if at the end of next week, Mark Drakeford was in a position to form a minority government, he would still be in a position to seek uh, the agreement from Plaid Cymru one way or another in, in forming government, it's better he knows it's better to have a stable government long term. So he, he would rather be in that position, some sort of long term agreement with Plaid Cymru uh, um, in terms of managing that government rather than to have, having a, an unstable government, you know, because they've, they've got to pay the nurses. Yeah, I, th I, I can clear with that. As in people like that politics where people are not so aggressive and, you know, just the nature of the debate in, in the Senate you know, people tend to, it's more consensual, and I think that's better when we have that in terms of government. The one party will get an overall majority. Parties need to work together. It's normal across the world. We just need to get over our hang-ups about it and just be have the adult conversation about, you know, what that programme of government's going to look like. Um, and I think that's that's good to see. It's, it's good for politics, as I said. It's, it's the norm, normal way of doing things across the world. But also, although we have had agreements every year, formal, informal, Labour applied, Labour Lib Dem, et cetera, et cetera, since 99, that isn't always the way of doing it. There are other models of working with different parties, and I'm sure political parties in Wales will be looking at those at the moment in terms of how you work multi-party in government, ministers outside of the cabinet, or, you know, there's loads of different ways of doing it, and there is no rule. You, you can make it up as long as you pass your... You don't need to pass legislation, even. You don't, you know, a government can govern without passing legislation, as long as you get the budget through once a year. So as long as you get 31 votes to support your budget once a year, you, you know, you can, you can govern. So there are different ways of doing it, and you can kind of make a Welsh solution, which I'm sure looking at the polling that we'll see after Friday. Do you think that Plaid and Labour are more similar than some of their supporters would ever like to admit? If you look at all the mainstream party manifestos, there, there is an awful lot in there this time around about investing in public services, valuing what we have valued over the last 12 months in terms of COVID, focusing very heavily on the recovery, recognising that climate change is real, trying to tackle um, the sort of post-industrial economy. So there is a huge amount of agreement across the piece in all parties. You know, you can look at, at where they differ and, and that does rather reflect where they are electorally successful. 
Um, and I think that some, the work has to be done on reaching that harmonious consensus, which, you know, is sort of equally challenging for both parties, if you see what I mean. This isn't about scoring points when you're in government. This is about agreeing a programme of government in some detail ahead of time, knowing that not everybody in your um, electoral cohorts are going to be very happy about that on both sides, but actually agreeing in the main, we've got to find a way through this. So we're going to have some really interesting conversations. And I think just something I've I've said quite often is the fact that, you know, whatever, whoever's in power, whatever we do, we've got the Senate, which has a certain amount of powers and a certain amount of sort of political balance, which means it's really quite difficult to do very controversial things and things that take more than five years and things that are very expensive. So you've got to have at least two parties in agreement if you're going to reform the NHS or change the structure of the, you know, um, local authorities or build a motorway that costs two billion quid. Uh, you know, those big infrastructure projects, you've got to have an agreement with two parties to do that. So that has limited some of the huge reformist agenda. Um, so I think, you know, what might that potential one Wales two look like? Not dissimilar from the fundamentals of both manifestos without some of the, let's say, crazy stuff. We won't go into that now, Neris. Um, and I think that some of the um, potential for disagreement is around actually it's on it's around environmentalism and how far we go with that over the next five years and who's who's whose voice is the loudest in that in that debate you know the the need to reform the land use uh, system uh, and how far we can go on that could be tempered somewhat by electoral cohorts that support Ply Cymru and no doubt Ply Cymru's um, ambitions around constitutional change may be somewhat tempered by the cohorts within the Labour group. So I think, you know, that's where we might see some of those disagreements over the next two years. Um, but it's something that both Mark Drakeford and, and, and Adam Price know that they're going to have to grapple with, I guess, in order to form that, um, that government, if that is the way that it goes. You know, we can't be sure. Yes, we're talking about it. You know, there's quite a significant potential after, after next week for, for it to be an element of a Labour-led government to some degree, but with, you know, some form of applied uh, balance, whether it's formal or informal. I guess that's what we're talking about. It could be something completely different, but... Um, I was going to ask whether you thought there was any chance at all of applied conservative coalition. Do you think they are too far apart from each other now for that to ever happen? Wow. Because obviously when Neris went in in 2007, there was huge talk about a rainbow coalition, but that doesn't seem to be the order of the day anymore. Can I, can I come in on this? Yeah. Kathy, you, you've had your say there about Labour and Plaid. Um, yeah, 2007, not just talk, there was an agreement. I think I've got a copy of it here somewhere, and I'm sure it's easily available. Is it on our manifesto website? Maybe we need to put it on there. But yeah, that you know, but the political reality there is very different to the political reality now. Um, so, you know, I don't think it's an option at all. You know, we've got Boris in government, we've got Andrew R.T. Davis leading the Tories here, very different in terms of where we were at in 2007. We had Nick Bourne and Ye Yan, a lot of trust, friendship between them. Context is completely different. Um, so I don't, I don't think that's uh, on the table for, for this week. Can I go back to the question about Plaid and Labour? Oh, sorry, yeah. nice. I think it was my turn to respond to that particular question. <laughs> Um, let me just think about this. I'm, I'd say everything has already happened before, you know. So we have a system which delivers multi-party government and has delivered multi-party government for 21 years. That is not going to change. What has got to change is these daft politicians ruling things in and out and then, you know, having to renege on that anyway. And it's just daft. It's like, look, we all know you're all going to have to have a sit down and have a, com a sensible conversation about how we're going to deliver a £14 billion budget and, you know, and run public services in Wales. Get over yourselves. Stop ruling things in and out and, you know, get around the table and have that conversation. And, um, you know, yes, it seems less likely now uh, politically, but, it, you know, it, it wasn't just 2007. It was every election before, during and since. So it is, a it is entirely appropriate that every party speaks to every other party. It happens at every election. It's going to happen at this election, you know, and we should just expect it. And I just think, you know, ruling stuff out is just a bit daft at this point. 
But going back to the question about labour and plight, I think, yeah, fine on some of the social justice agenda. And if you look at the manifestos, there is a lot of common ground. If you look at the compacts and, and the budget agreements and the legislative support um, between both parties in the last couple of years, there is a lot of common ground. But fundamentally, you know, the, the point of disagreement is the lack of ambition in terms of ways of the nation, powers, constitution, you know, all of that, that's just missing from the Labour Party. And that is fundamentally the difference. We have different political opinions very strongly held, but fundamentally it's that belief in that we, you know, the play company belief is that we're, we're a nation, we should have the powers, we should have independence, we should be able to make these decisions for ourselves. And that is the massive dividing line between the ambition that we've got compared to the Labour Manifesto. So yeah, fine, on some of the social policies, some of the things that the Assembly at Senate has powers over, there's a lot of com common ground. So I, I would see it quite easy to, to put a coalition, a formal informal uh, agreement together between the two parties based on the manifestos. But as you said, Cathy, there is also common ground. And the reality is 2007, it was easy to put together that rainbow document. And actually, tactically, it was quite important that that was in place because when when Wales government uh, was formed it was not too dissimilar from from the rainbow document so we you know already had the Tory support signed up to the policy pledges. It was important again also for for Plaid at the last elections to 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 talk to the Conservatives and UKIP to ensure that they voted for Leanne Wood as First Minister in order to have that negotiating position this really strong negotiating position that they had in order to deliver a pretty substantive um, confidence and supply agreement. So, you know, it, it, it's not, it, it is absolute, my point at the time and my point says, it's absolutely the right thing to do, but just, you know, just be up, up front about it. Don't say it didn't happen because you're gonna have to come out and say it happened afterwards. So, you know, just be, just be a bit more upfront about the whole thing. One of the finishing touches for these pre-election pods that we, we normally use is just ask our guests for their predictions and thoughts of where we'll be after the election. Hope you're both happy to do that. And just one of the things we did earlier on this evening as well was look at seats to, to watch out for. Any that you're particularly looking at? I'll let Neris go first. Sorry. I've been out canvassing in the Ronda internationally in Kamala West and Kamala East. So, you know, um, expect Liam to hold the Ronda. The recognition of her work and just the, you know, it's, it's just great going out canvassing with her in the round there. So although Labour are bigging that up, I think, um, I think Leanne will be okay in the round there. Tenesley, well, who's going to predict that? It's like, no, Cathy will, I know. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, such, it's, it's such, you know, it's such a close call and it has been since 99. We'll see what happens on Thursday. I don't think I even need to answer that question now. <laughs> the nurse has done it for me. No, I just think, look, in terms of the Ronda, I don't have any information other than obviously the Labour Party have had some pretty decent returns, but nothing I've heard from them is telling me that it's in the bag. I mean, I think it's too close to call at this point. I think Knefli is feeling a bit different. Um, and um, I, I think Lee is going to successfully hold on to that seat. I think Knefli has shift, shifted a bit, frankly. And I think the pretty significant um, results of general election uh, will demonstrate that. I think that Bailiff Cloyd and Wrexham, I think the ones that are, Tories are expecting to pick up. And I think that there are some seats in the middle where, where it's a bit soft, I guess, for the Labour Party, but nothing that I've heard so far suggests that they're going to switch. So, for example, Bridge End. You know, those seats where the Tories have won at the general election, for example, I think, you know, it's a softer vote for Labour, but they'll probably hold on to Bridgend, Cloyd South, and I don't think Dell and Alan Deeside are really up for grabs, unless I've got that, unless I've read that completely wrong. Um, so, you know, I think what, I think the story of this election is really remarkably about Boris versus Mark, in a sense, and it has been for the last 18 months since the start of the pandemic. Very clearly, you know, if you look at the polling the last 18 months, if, the, if this election has happened 13, 14 months ago, um, Labour would have would have lost, you know, anything up to 10 seats and we would have had a potential Conservative win in, in the Senate. That has clearly not happened. Um, there's lots of reasons for that. So at the time that that, that, that poll in, in April happened, Jeremy Corbyn was still 
leader of the Labour Party. Uh, most people in Wales had never heard of Mark Chambers at that point. And, you know, we just started moving into this pandemic in which people were still, you know, looking at, you know, working together at UK level um, and making those decisions at a UK level, you know, the cut through hadn't really happened. And then over the next six months, I think we can see this huge drop off in conservative support in Wales. People saw more of Mark Drakeford. It's not just that he had a higher profile, that they liked what they saw when they saw him. Um, so that has proved really quite significant. We did see a little bit of a drop off from that in around November. People were really bored of lockdown in Wales. People were, you know, they were roused about Tampax in Tesco's. And, you know, and then after Christmas, there was sort of vaccine banks for Boris. The, the, the sofa stuff has just started to kick in, but I think, um, you know, those polls have certainly shifted by about 11 points, 11 seats, sorry, not 11 points, 11 seats for the Tories, and that really is a bit of a roller coaster for them. You know, the, the Conservatives have significantly underperformed the UK Conservatives at every Senate election. You can't keep blaming bad luck and steel crisis, you know, so it, it just feels, obviously, it feels better for the Labour Party towards towards the, the the election date and you know overall maybe three or four seats I think that they might lose does that you know and then then we'll see the press release releases which would involve a uh, the Labour people the Labour Party have lost the Labour Party you know the people are calling for change um and uh, there'll be press releases from from the Tory party saying don't let the Labour Party work with the separatists you know you can imagine the language that they will all start using from day one um, uh, but, but really, you've got to ignore that froth and look, about, look at what's going on behind and what their real negotiating tactics are going to be. Just one of the, just one little question for me, just to, uh, at the end. I know that we're, we're close to wrap up, if not overrunning slightly. One of the weirdly different things about a Welsh election, as opposed to uh, an election across the border in England or in Scotland, is that it's only people in Wales that seem to care about it. Um, but this time around, we have started to see a little bit of coverage in the UK media and even, you know, Ireland and elsewhere have even paid, you know, a very, very small amount of interest in Wales. Do you think that this is a, in, in some ways or another, a breakout election for the Welsh Parliament in any way? Or, no. oh, wow. Your, no. your two faces, for <laughs> listeners, the two faces of both Cathy and Neris right now is really despondent and um, this is not going to be an optimistic answer. No, I think I think if you looked at every broadsheet coverage, it would be just exactly the same as it was five years ago, where they sent one random person to Wales once uh, it, during the middle of the election, and the whole story is about how different it is from England rather than what, what's going on here. It's just, you know that's and we can't expect any more than that at this point in time. Um, you know they're just not interested. That it's it's not going to change. Uh, Are they not interested because we're not interesting? You know, we're not interesting to people who live within the M25. That's, let's just, you know, that's basically it. It's just not good enough, is it? Is in the analysis on the BBC and other broad, broadcasters, it's just all in the context of um, English yeah. local elections or Scotland, and, you know, maybe an add-on of what's happening here. And it, and it reflects what we've seen in terms of the pandemic stuff, and uh, it's just all framed around England. Um, and yes, it's depressing. And that's why trying to get your message out in different ways is so important for the parties here in Wales. But um, as I said, I think the first point is increasing awareness because of COVID and the powers we've got here. So it's a good thing, but we've still got so long, such a long way to go to get that message out there in terms of what actually the difference these these elections and, and what the government can do here in Wales is depressing. And on that happy, happy <laughs> note, uh, nice Daenerys, showing, showing ambition for Wales. Need some kind of constitutional reform to lighten things up. A bit. Um, that, that's, the, that's the introduction yeah. to the pod that's sorted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say thank you so much both to Cathy and Neris for coming along to talk to us tonight. Uh, if people want to hear more from you and find you on Twitter, where can they go, Cathy? Oh gosh, Cathy underscore Owens. Grant and Neris. I'm just Neris Evans. It's only one. Brilliant. <laughs> There's only one. Uh, well, thank you so much for talking to us tonight. And if you want to find out more about what's happening at Here I, please find us on Medium at Here I Blog Cymru, on Facebook at Here I Blog Cymru, and on Twitter at Here I Blog. Thank you for listening to Here I. If you like what you heard, please don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review.